Blues Claire, Jangology, and above all, the wonderful nuage, which means clouds. kinds of music. When asked what moved him the most musically, he answered, there's Ravel's Vals Noble et Sentimental. I can't forget Bach's Toccata and Fugue, where the music reaches my heart and makes me cry. Debussy is maybe the closest to my musical ideal, as in him I can find the sensitivity and intelligence that I demand from all music. In fact, Django attempted to venture compositionally into the great classical music forms. He composed an organ mass, which was performed at least once, and a symphony for choir and orchestra, which would include words by his all-time fervent admirer, Jean Cocteau. But Cocteau couldn't finish the text on time for the announced concert, and the conductor of the orchestra judged the music too modern, so the work wasn't ever performed. Both compositions' original scores were lost soon after and have never been found since. Django also loved painting, and in the early 50s, in a period when his popularity decreased, obscured by the rise of modern jazz, and recording contracts were sparse, he moved to a new home in Samoa with Nagin and their little son Babik, who would also become a jazz guitar player. In Samoa, Django painted picture after picture. When any visitor wanted him to play the guitar, he usually answered, don't talk to me about music, at the moment I'm painting. to Charles Delaunay, during this period, Django seemed to be more proud of his painting than of his music. In 
But he had not been totally forgotten. And by 1953, the famous American jazz promoter Norman Granz set his eye on him. For Granz, Django recorded some songs that would be released in the brand new format, a long play disc. The wonderful music produced on that session was followed by the promise to include Django in the next Jazz at the Philharmonic tours, in which he would play side by side with figures like his old friend Coleman Hawkins, singer Billy Holiday, trumpet star Dizzy Gillespie, and alto sax genius Charlie Parker. It seemed that the old dream would at last come true. But none of this would ever happen. On May the 15th, 1953, Django's heart began to fail and stopped forever. He was only 43. His musical legacy, however, continues to astonish the world and has since influenced every jazz guitar to follow in his wake. I was first inspired by Django, said Joe Pass. I'd never heard anyone play like him, so flowing and modern. I wanted to play with exactly the same expression. Musically speaking, added Stefan Grappelli, Django was uncompromising. He was fully aware of his worth. A wrong note would have the same effect as an insult. He couldn't bear the mediocrity of certain accompanists. Despite his dreamy and peace-loving nature, he became violent and even sarcastic on these occasions. I believe that he heard more music than the orchestra was capable of playing. Not long after his death, the surviving members of the quintet were reunited for one last time before the movie cameras to play a tribute to Django. On this musical goodbye to their friend, seated next to Stefan Grappelli, Django's brother Joseph plays the lead guitar. Visibly moved, they performed this version of the quintet's classic minor swing. Mm -hmm. 